All right, uh, this is Shane Fisher. I hope you're doing well today. I have with me once again, David Key. Say hello, Brother David. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this podcast. I'm looking forward to it. We are, of course, uh, looking at the date and prophecies of Daniel. So we looked at the date in our first section. So check it out if you haven't done so. Part two, we looked at Daniel chapter two. Today we'll be looking at Daniel seven, which is similar to Daniel chapter two. Uh, but I just want to urge everyone to look at this book that Brother David Key wrote. And actually, you can contact him by his email, which I put down there, davidkey312 at gmail.com. So that's, uh, that's all I need to say. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll work. You can, you, you can just contact my email. And uh, if you want a copy of my book, um, I'll be happy to, to get it to you. Okay. So... Um, Daniel chapter 7, let's get into it. So Daniel 1 through 6, we didn't really cover this, but basically it's the historical accounts of Daniel and his three friends and how um, you know Nebuchadnezzar had a vision. Uh, also, even Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall. Um, and it also talks about their trials that Daniel and his three friends go through. Uh, but Daniel 7 through 12 is very neglected uh, because... <laughs> A lot of people just don't, um, either they don't want to understand or they just don't want to take the time to understand. But this is very important to understand because it builds your faith. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important because, as we'll soon see in chapter seven, this, this prophecy, uh, Jesus makes reference to this prophecy numerous times in his earthly ministry. And a lot of people aren't aware of that and aren't aware exactly the significance of that. So I think it's a very important prophecy to consider. Yeah, I mean, certainly we agree it's tougher, but um, and it does require a lot of study, but it's worth going through. So I, I agree, definitely. All right, so Daniel 7, verse 1, you want to start us off? Sure. Daniel 7, verse 1. In the first year that Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Now, of course, some people might think, oh, there's a contradiction because, you know, back in Daniel 5 to 31, we find Belshazzar died, right? And here we have him uh, coming up again. But notice, friends, it says in the first year. So, um, you know, Daniel's not written in chronological order. It's written... There's a reason why it's written out of uh, written chronologically out of order, um, and give us some reason why is that that's the case, David. Well, uh, there's a lot of poetic structure going on here in the book. It's in, it's a, it's actually a beautifully written book, and a lot of people aren't aware of how Daniel is written and how it's structured. And so chapters two through seven were written in Aramaic, and so. Um, and as you'll see chapters in chapter two and chapter seven, that material mirrors each other. And so because of that reason, because of the way the book itself is structured, um, it doesn't always follow a chronological order. Right. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, a book in and of itself, like chapter two, chapter seven, and, you know, it closes in. Um, and it's, you know, you know it's, it's worth noting, it's worth noting, too, that this is not uncommon in, in, in books of the Bible both in the Old and New Testament. Like, uh, for instance, in the Gospels, some of the Gospels were written chronologically, whereas others were written topically. And so, you mm -hmm. know, it, it just depends on the intention of the writer and how he wants to structure the material. So like we said, this, this was around, uh, it says, the first year of Belshazzar, so it would have been around 553 B.C. Uh, and then also, um, oh, uh, I uh, must have got that one wrong. Uh, 553 or 550? Why did I do that for? <laughs> well, you know, hey, 550, 553, it's it's close enough. We know it's in the 6th century. <laughs> my my fault, my fault. I, you know, I try to correct the slides as much as I can, but sometimes I'll let something slip. So, uh, so just to let y'all know, please look up that date for yourself. <laughs> we want to, we, uh, anyway, so... Like we say, when we talk about the this uh, chapter 7, once again, we look at this prophecy in detail, and we're going to see that 
everything that Daniel talks about came to pass. And so he's a true prophet. Um, and that's something that we need to take note of. And that's why, um, that's why I've been looking on YouTube and I've seen a lot of uh, skeptics and agnostics uh, who are trying to, you know, say, well, it was written in the second century BC. Um, and, you know, when we get to chapter nine, when we talk about that Sydney Weeks prophecy. That's just not going to work. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so, I mean, that's, so anyways, let's just keep going. So Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. First was like a lion, had an eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So notice it says uh, these four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Um, so, David, why why do you believe the imagery of wind is used in this vision? Well, I think I think it's a symbol of God working. Uh, you know, often wind is you know this in, in both Hebrew and Greek, winds is used. Uh, it could mean the Holy Spirit or, you know, or it could literally be wind. And so I, I think it probably is an allusion to God's activity. Um, and the great sea there, you know, when we think of a great sea, we think of, like, as you have here, the upheaval. You know, when you have a ship on a sea, oftentimes the ship gets tossed to and fro. And so I think this imagery, yeah, I think this imagery is, des is describing uh, the upheaval of societies. And, I like how you're uh, using biblical, biblical phrases there, tossed to and fro. Tossed to and fro, yes. <laughs> every yes. wind of doctrine. Uh, <laughs> and every wind of doctrine, yes. And so, you know, and, and liberal critics really don't disagree with this type of, you know, understanding of the imagery. I think pretty much everybody who studies Daniel thinks that the imagery is describing, you know, world empires in societies and so forth. The question is always, you know, which world empires under consideration. So this is really not, you know, a, something that's really that controversial. It's just more about identifying, you know, which world empire Daniel's talking about. Yeah. Um, I like what McWiggan says. He says, as the wind is invisible, but it clearly affects things. So is, is of God who is invisible, but affects things in the universe. So. Yes, I think that's a good observation. All right. So, uh, I mean, we could talk about, for example, um, it says about God using Cyrus, for example, through his, through his providence. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The word, Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And, you know, he, he made a proclamation saying that, hey, uh, you Jews could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. So... Um, yes, so we we see that God works in the kingdoms of men. Well, you know, remarkably, God can use the free will of man and still accomplish His will, which is a miracle in and of itself. And this this uh, idea of winds is used elsewhere. Uh, Jeremiah forty nine thirty six um, against Elam, I will bring the four winds. Um, so Daniel, uh, right. even Daniel eight eight, which we will get to in, at some point. Um, Daniel 11, verse 4. Um, so just giving people an idea here of that of what that God is working behind the scenes. Yes. Um, so it's stirring yes. up the great sea. So the sea represents, um, you know, um, the we could say the area surrounding the great sea or the Mediterranean, um, in which, I mean, as we know, uh, just right to the east, here, I mean, there there is a lot of activity going well all around that area. There are things going on with the changing of of kingdoms, with you know regards to Babylon to the east, and then we got you know Medo Persia, which um, which is right up there. Um, to the, so, I mean, it makes sense. Um, like you were saying, society is in upheaval. Uh, it's there's a lot yeah. of chaos. It's unsettled. It's agitated, but sometimes it's calm. But then it becomes chaos again. So I think the, the image is really kind of a perfect way to describe it. You know, when you're out on when you're out on the sea, sometimes you know the wind is calm and things are great, but it doesn't take a whole lot of wind to cause you to you know to cause the boat to shake and move and and you can become sick pretty easily. <laughs> right. And if it gets worse and worse, you could be drowned. So. 
Uh, um, pretty amazing imagery, I think. So four imagery. great, so four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Um, so why do you why do you suppose this imagery of animals is you are used for kingdoms? Um, what was um, your I, I think yeah, I, I think the animals. Uh, each animal itself brings to mind a certain quality or trait. You know, I think like like the image of a lion, I think of somebody who's keenly, who could be ferocious, powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, you also have the imagery of, of like eagle's wings, you know, that could indicate, you know, the vision of the kingdom. It could also indicate the speed at which the kingdom, you know, is active and comes to power and things of that nature. And uh, some of these some of these animals are ferocious looking. You know, you got the image of the bear, of the leopard, mm -hmm. the lion. You know, you know, human beings naturally would be afraid of these animals, especially you know, I mean, you read Daniel in the lion's den. Obviously, uh, walk, you know, if you walked into a den of lions, uh, you would be pretty scared. And I think that's the you know to some degree the idea uh, of why these animals are being used as as images. Mm -hmm. What do you have in mind? Oh, I, I have no more. You, you pretty much said what I said. <laughs> what, I was, what, I, what I would have said. Uh, so, you know, we know, we know earlier in Daniel 4 that Nebuchadnezzar's pride got to him and God actually uh, made him to become like an animal and eat grass like an, like an ox. Um, yeah, it, there seems to be an allusion to that incident here. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was made to basically eat like an animal, but then God God reversed that at the end of that whole mm -hmm. uh, incident in Nebuchadnezzar. When after God reversed it, he recognized he was humbled by it, and I think mm -hmm. that's what's indi indicated here is that Nebuchadnezzar and in Babylon, God humbled God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, God humbled Babylon. Ultimately, God humbled Babylon by by allowing the Medes and Persians to conquer it. I mean, I, I think it has in some sense to do with um, the creation mandate that mankind was created in the image of God. Uh -huh. He was to have dominion over the animals. And uh, when you have, when we think about this creation order, that God is, of course, the one who is the king of kings, and he allows man to rule over the earth, in which man is also to rule over the animals. And then you have it's the case where, uh, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a man, became just like an animal, so that he right. could, so that he could understand his place that he is under God. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. Um, so, and you know, this has something to, uh, also to do with that these kingdoms are represented as animals because, like you just said, um, are animals created in the image of God? They're not. They don't have an eternal spirit like man does. Um, and I think it's interesting that what, we'll, what we're going to find is that the kingdom of God is given to the Son of Man from the Ancient of Days, and it's going to last forever. And and Jesus is even called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians yes. 15, 45. Um, so just to let everybody know that's the last Adam. So... I think there's something about here um, that, unfortunately, the world is not the what the way it should be, uh, like it was it was supposed to be. Exactly, God cursed it because of man's sin. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyways, going a little bit further, I think there's an application for this in that you know, unfortunately, uh, in our society today, this this um, this is taught in our school system and there's no evidence for it of macroevolution and yet you know there's some there's some dangerous implications that come from this and that you know if you really do believe that your ancestor was an animal just an animal only then i mean you're going to i mean eventually you're you're going to draw the logical conclusion that hey i can treat other people like animals and so basically you, you can just murder them you know um, yeah, in, in, the, in the animal kingdom, there's there is no moral law. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, even even Darwin recognized you know, survival of the fittest, basically, in, right. in the animal kingdom. And and that and so if you take it to the to its logical conclusion, 
then basically might makes right. But right. if you really press somebody, even in, even the hard evolutionists, most people who believe in evolution cannot take evolution to its logical conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, because if they did, they would have to agree that might makes right, which is Mm -hmm. intuitively wrong everybody knows um intuitively i think because we're created in the image of god Mm -hmm. um you know you would have to have your conscience seared over time and i think that's what happened with mankind over time man's had his conscience seared um and you can see that just by reading history you know like we were talking about in in our last podcast about Rome and the gladiatorial, you know, all that and how they would watch human beings get slaughtered, you know, in the gladiatorial shows. And just intuitively, that just seems wrong. Yet, how could they do that? Because over time, you know, man's conscience has become seared. And yeah. and uh, but that's not I don't think that's really natural uh, for, for mankind. You, that almost has to be really taught to believe that, you mm-hmm. know. And um, and I think Christianity, you know, obviously, basically brought mankind back to its senses, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, we, result, we, yeah, we recognize that we're made in the image of God, and that Jesus is the the true the 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 last Adam, and He wants us to, you know, rule with Him, so to speak, as it, yes, as we're going as we're going to talk about soon <laughs> yeah and so these and so these beasts represent the you know these earthly kingdoms have left god and they mm-hmm. they're creating all this chaos and right. upheaval and so kingdoms are being you know raised and kingdoms are falling and uh even though you know god controls it all at the same time he's using the evil choices of man and at the same time he can still bring about his will, even despite the evil choices of mankind. And I think that's what history has shown. And that's how Christianity, when you really look at how it developed, you know, God is able to use the Roman Empire. God is able to use, you know, he used the Roman Empire to judge. And we'll get into that later in this this prophecy. He'll, you know, he used the Roman Empire to judge his people, to judge mm-hmm. Israel, ultimately. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I... Even though Rome meant it for evil, God, of course, meant it for good. And, of course, you know, uh, same with Joseph, with Joseph. You know, Joseph makes that famous statement. Mm-hmm. You know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God can use the evil choices of man and still bring about his righteous will, which mm-hmm. is pretty amazing. Okay, so let's talk, talk more about this first animal. And first kingdom was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. It was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So, remember last time we talked about in Daniel 2, the statue of the, and the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's, or the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And we know that Babylon lasted till 605 to 539 B.C. Then the Medo-Persians came along, then Greece came along, and then Rome came along. Um, now what we're going to see is the head of gold corresponds to the lion, right? And yes. The, uh, and so why is Babylon like a lion? Well, it's ferocious, it's royal royalty, and you know it's king of the jungle, uh, so right. to speak. But it's also using the scriptures. So let's look at some of the scriptures here. Um, you want to read that for us? Sure. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge. Do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. So just notice here, the, the predator is coming. Um, yeah. And we know this represents Babylon because that's what Jeremiah talks about in his book, that that's God's instrument of judgment on his people, Israel. Yes. Uh, and then there's Jeremiah 50, 17. Israel's like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria devoured him. Now, at last, this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon has broken his bones. So just noticing right. the imagery there that he's a lion, like a lion. 
All right, so what? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say in chapter two, Daniel basically tells Nebuchadnezzar that you're the head of gold. And so if the imagery is parallel in both of these, then obviously Babylon has to be the lion then. And I don't think anybody, liberal critics, don't don't uh, disagree with that. So. so why does Babylon have eagle's wings? Um, you know, an eagle, has a, I think the wings here indicates, you know, how high and how quickly it can move. Mm-hmm. Uh, it represents speed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, could, it, could, it could indicate, you know, the vision that Babylon had of becoming a world power and so, and so forth. And, but I think, it, I think here it refers to speed. I think you're correct. I think that's prob- primarily what it seems to be referring to. And when we get into the image of Alexander the Great, you know, later on, the the image of wings is intensified, and so that seems to indicate the speed there. Yeah, and, and the fact they were able to conquer uh, the capital of Nineveh is pretty amazing, uh, the, of the Assyrian Empire, so right. pretty interesting stuff. Um, what does it mean that the wings were plucked off? What does that mean? Yeah, God humbled, uh, mm-hmm. God humbled them. Uh, I think that probably refers probably to the fall of Babylon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Of course, Daniel, record, Daniel records that in the last chapter, you know, in chapter 6. Right. That's right. So um, I think that's probably what it's referring to. Okay. So then we have the Medo-Persian Empire coming next. Now, like we said, some liberal critics will say, well, it's Media, then Persia. Um, but we there's yes. some good reasons why this is a joint kingdom um and why the 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 arms of silver uh correspond to the bear um and uh so verse five and six says and suddenly another beast a second like a bear it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour much flesh so what does it mean that this nation was like a bear (laughs) Um, I think it's, it's indicating, well, well, for instance, uh, the head of gold, it said that he would, that the next kingdom would be inferior. So it's still a ferocious kingdom, but it's not as, as grand, I said, I guess as Babylon was Babylon, right. you know, mm-hmm. it had one of the, one of the uh, seven wonders of the world and, you know, the hanging, hanging gardens of Babylon, you know, it was, it was, you know, it, it, the Medo-Persian Empire um, was the. I've done some research on it, and the, the Medo-Persian Empire was not as centralized in terms of its power, and I think there was a weakening politically, even yeah. though it still, you know, was the next world empire. That you know, it w- it was in a sense inferior, and so I think the bear still indicates that it's ferocious, but it's not grand as the lion. And, mm-hmm. and I, I could be wrong. Think so I think all I think. Well, this fits better with us that we talk about it being Medo Persia and not just, you know, separating the two, Media uh-huh. and Persia, because of this symbol here. What does it mean that the bear was raised up on one side? I mean, we know that bears have two sides. <laughs> so, you know, raised up on one side, so they were yes. unequal. So, and I think that that gets back to the inferiority of the Medo Persian Empire. You know, Babylon was one centralized force. Whereas the Medo-Persian Empire was, uh, had, you know, while the Persians dominated, it was still not one, one entity. It was a joint, um, a joint empire, even though the Persians dominated. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it shows it's uneven. It shows that it was raised up on one side. All right. So what do you think it means when the bear had three ribs in his mouth? What does that mean? Yeah, my research, uh, that's exactly it right there. Um, <laughs> Babylon, Libya, and Egypt. Uh, pro- that's probably what it re- it's referring to. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure. That's probably the best interpretation of it, in my mm-hmm. view. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that fits the imagery. And so, you know, I think the main, the main thing is, you know, this, this, the, the imagery fits the Medo-Persian Empire. And in the book of Daniel, that's the next empire after Babylon. And when you look at chapters 5 and 6, 
you know, you have Darius the Mede, you have Cyrus the Persian. And we can debate about, you know, who Darius the Mede was and everything. But um, the fact that, you know, we have a joint empire, it wasn't just the Medes and it wasn't just the Persians. It's described as, you know, the law of the Medes and Persians in chapter mm -hmm. six. And, and, and some of these, uh, uh, I was going to say, some of these Persian kings are mentioned in the scriptures, like Cyrus. He allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. Yes. Um, Xerxes, who is known to us as ha Ahasuerus, he's, uh -huh. he becomes the husband of Esther, and he lost the sea battle at Salamis uh, in the, the Greek-Persian yeah. Wars. Um, very, very interesting to read about that, if y'all haven't studied studied that. Yeah, if you, if you read, you know, the prophet Isaiah, I think it's chapters 44 and 45, I think the end of 44 and the beginning of 45, mm -hmm. um, Isaiah actually identifies Cyrus by name as, you yeah, know, 150, 150 years before he actually, you know, liberated the Jews from, from Babylon, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, you know, liberal critics, that's one of the reasons why they don't like to date, or the, one of the reasons why they don't like the book of Isaiah to be one book. They try to break it up into two or three pieces and... You know, they try to argue that Isaiah wrote after the fact, just like they try to argue that Daniel wrote after the fact. Mm -hmm. And that's that's all, that's an all a whole nother uh, discussion. But it's interesting to note, you know, if you take the scriptural position, you know, that Isaiah wrote 150 years before Cyrus, he actually identifies him by name. All right, going on, it says, after this, I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast ha also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. All right, so the leopard, which would definitely be Greece. Um, yes. And leopard definitely is known for his speed. <laughs> so yes, that's why leopard so. is fast. And then you've got the 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 wings. What is it like? Four wings, I think, in this context. So the the imagery of wings is is, is even intensified. So. Mm -hmm. uh, um, swift agile yeah, yeah four four wings because you know it's going to conquer much of the, uh, a lot of the land and now why does it have four and here's the reason why i mean when you think about the campaign of of alexander just starting up here in 336 bc and then i mean yeah, all the way uh, to three all the way to 323 um that's, I mean, that's what, just thir 13, 13 years, years. <laughs> um, in 13 years he conquers the, the known world right yeah i mean it's it's that's just crazy it's amazing. And he did all and he did all that before before he turned 33 mm -hmm. or 32 something like that 32 33 yeah so, something he was like. a young he was a young guy yeah and uh now why did it have four heads well um because it represents the four divisions of of his kingdom, I, you know, Alexander, uh, it did not pass that pass down to his posterity like normally kingdoms would do. Um, this one was actually given to his generals, and it took a while for these generals. They fought against each other for quite some time, but it came down to four, um, and that's that's pretty interesting. I mean, the Bible gets that right. Um, so yes. they were called the Diadochi, uh, the or the successors of Alexander. So uh, we got Seleu Seleucus in the east. He controlled Babylon, Persia, and Syria. So you can kind of see the area in yellow there. And then we got, um, we got, of course, Ptolemy in the south, Egypt, and Israel. And then we got Cassander in the west, Macedonia and Greece. And then we got Lysimachus in the north of Asia Minor. So... I mean, yeah, and it's it's worth noting that later on in the book of Daniel, uh, the prophecies of chapter, you're gonna you you you're gonna see kings of the north and kings of the of the south, and that's the Seleucids and mm -hmm. the, the ones who are in the yellow Egypt. in the yellow here, and yeah, and there's the blue part. So I mean, so, so it so it's important to know kind of what's going on here. So the Grecian Empire, you know, has these four parts based upon those four generals. And Daniel's going to focus in on those two parts, the Seleucus and Ptolemy. 
uh, mm-hmm. those empire, those those parts of the empire that, and because Jerusalem is right in between those two. <laughs> And yeah, they're gonna be playing political football before between yeah, each other. For- <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's kind. Of, that's why it's it's really kind of crazy. But that that prophecy in chapter eleven is pretty pretty amazing. So it's important to note how as these prophecies move along, they get more specific and more specific. Mm-hmm. All right. So then we move to Rome uh, now. With the imagery of this, uh, we just it don't mention an animal, so I just got the Lord of the Rings <laughs> guy. <laughs> so yeah, because it, it's pretty for it's it's more ferocious than the lion and the bear and the leopard. So why do you think Shane? Why do you think the um, why do you think that a unknown <laughs> animal is being used to describe Rome? I mean, I have my my ideas, but I'm just wondering what you think. Well, okay, so let's let me read it and then I'll. I'll kind of give us some thoughts to it. So it says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was concerned the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uh, speaking pompous words. So... Uh, to answer your question, why is it an unknown animal? Um, I think part of the reason has to do with well, later on, in, we're going to read Revelation 13, and it, you know, talks about how this animal uh, absorbed all the other kingdoms, so it was kind of like a mixture. So uh, you really, um, that's my basically take on it. So if you have yeah, a mixture, you like can't a, really. Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid animal then. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. What's, well, what's your what was your take? Well, yeah, mine is, is similar. I, I think also I think because the prophecy is going to focus in on the Roman Empire, like the rest of the prophecy, you know, with the tin horns and the little horn, the rest of the prophecy kind of focuses in on the Roman Empire. And so I, I think that Daniel is highlighting the fact that this is a really ferocious kingdom and uh, it's so ferocious, we can't even use uh, an animal in nature to describe it. You know, it's going to be like a hybrid. And I think mm-hmm. it's just intensifying, you know, the power of Rome. And uh, but I think both ideas, I think to me that makes the most sense why Daniel would use. I think both ideas certainly are reasonable. And it's probably a little bit of both. All right, so we already kind of said Fourth Beast represents the Roman Empire. It's voracious, it's cruel, it's destructive. Um, yeah, yeah. There's no animal comparison because of the terrifying descriptions it has. It's Like we said, it's a mixture of all the animals that came before it. Um, yeah. it, had, it has ten horns. Um, so let's talk about those ten horns and the little horn. Um, so, well, before we get to that, we got to read a little bit more. Uh, so... The Bible says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Um, so now now we've switched from the great sea and we're looking into heaven itself. Um, yeah, we got the, the imagery here. You know, it says thrones and then it, it talks about the Ancient of Days being seated here. I think this is showing the kingly authority, you know, the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, then you've so, got, yeah, go ahead. Well, who is the Ancient of Days, and why is he called this title? Well, I mean, the Ancient of Days, uh, obviously in the Old Testament, is, I think, is God. You know, it's mm-hmm. Yahweh. Now, mm-hmm. you know, there's a debate about, is it the, like you have there, is it the first person of the Trinity, or is it referring maybe to, to Jesus, or what, or is it referring to all, is it referring to the Godhead, um, I think um, probably a reference to the first person of the Trinity. Well, and because he's going to give him the give the Son of Man the yes. kingdom. Um, yes, and so I th- I think that's probably the case. Um, so yeah, the first person of the Trinity in the New Testament, the first person of the Trinity, of course, is the Father. You know, and it, and, and it uh, has all these ideas like great age, wisdom, dignity, honor, eternality. Associated yeah, with the, yeah, you've got, I think, what is it, uh, white here, the, 
the hair is wool or whatever. That that's a symbol yeah. of yeah. That's where uh, I Yeah, that. white as why don't you yeah, read it? the hair of his head. <laughs> yeah, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Um, that to me indicates both wisdom and purity. You know, his Ho- garment holiness. was white as snow, yeah. holiness, purity, and then the 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 head there. I think is a symbol of his wisdom. God, you know, God knows he's omniscient. He's the one that's calling the shots in the mm. you know in, in the great sea. And I think that gets back to those four winds in the great sea. And I think that's pointing back to that idea. Go ahead and read the next um, line. Yeah, and then it says his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Um, I see in this a reference to his judgment. So you have mm-hmm. here both the kingly nature of God as well as his judgment mm-hmm. is the main emphasis here of the imagery. A fiery mm-hmm. stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousands and so forth. Yeah, ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books. He noticed the books were open. This type of imagery indicates judgment. You know, the books mm-hmm. were open. The book of life, and I think the book of life, is other places in the Old Testament. So, you know, this imagery is is not unheard of in in, in the Bible as a whole. It's, you know, God God keeps a record of everything, and everything will be brought into judgment ultimately. So you kind of already answered where the books are open, mean, and why. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, and this, you know, we need to keep in mind that God judges, God can judge nations physically, and He can judge nations. Ultimately, He will judge them spiritually. Like the uh, the pagan nations will be judged individually on the last day in judgment. But you know, you know, in Isaiah thirteen, God you know, brought Babylon down. And of course, in Daniel 6, we have the historical account of God bringing Babylon down. He can use other pagan nations to judge other pagan nations. And so God can, God can judge physically in this life by bringing a nation down. And ultimately, the individuals that make up those nations will be judged spiritually. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think both ideas could be involved here. Mm-hmm. All right, so it says, I watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So what's going on here, David, in regards to this? All right, well, okay, he says he watched uh, because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. So... We'll get into later who the horn is. Um, mm-hmm. Reference yeah. there to the little horn, and I don't want to. I don't want to give away the bag because of <laughs> yet. Uh, we'll get out of the bag. Just a moment. <laughs> horn, yeah. Give away the yeah. I don't want to give away the cat out of the bag. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, so the horn represents the entire fourth beast, the entire Roman Empire. Because notice it says, "I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed." and given to the burning flame. So here, I think this encompasses both God's judgment against the little horn, ultimately, as well as the judgment against the entire Roman Empire. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it says here, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, uh, uh, yet their lives were prolonged. I think this gets back to what you were saying, how Rome absorbed those other kingdoms, whereas the Roman Empire was not really... Uh, when when the uh, when the church conquered the Roman Empire, it basically turned the Roman Empire upside down, and the church did not absorb the the earthly nature of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the idea here. Um, yeah, um, the other beasts are judged, stripped of their authority, but are allowed to continue for a short time, and they lived on in Rome. And yes. Rome was the embodiment of all the other three kingdoms combined, and. God's judgment is going to come upon the Roman Empire. So, yeah, pretty simple. And like, yeah, and like I said, there's a physical aspect to God's judgment. You know, Rome was destroyed or conquered physically, and you can say that in history. There's also a spiritual aspect to that judgment. On the last day, you know, Jesus talked about, you know, that everybody will have to give it, have to give an account. And so everybody that makes up the Roman Empire, you know, 
that makes up that earthly Roman Empire, they're going to have to give an account on the last day as well. Right. So there's a physical and spiritual aspect to God's judgment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's amazing to me the unity of the Bible, because we have a revelation. It draws so much uh, allusions from the Old Testament, especially from Daniel. And here's here's one of those points, I mean, from Daniel 7. Uh, I mean, John says, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were li was like a feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Bingo. Go back to Daniel 7. You'll, yep. You know what I'm talking about here. And, uh, yeah, course, so that would... That would seem to indicate that the beast here in Revelation 13 is the Roman Empire, you know, after it had absorbed these previous kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Right. All yeah. right. So, which, that, which Daniel helps us understand Revelation. That, that could be a whole other po podcast right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like we said, the, the first three beasts were absorbed by another kingdom following, but Rome was destroyed. It was torn asunder by barbar barbarians, and, and it wasn't... Another king, it was not given to another kingdom, so right, right. Okay, so here's an interesting thing that we find, and you talk about this in your book. Um, the title that Jesus uses of himself in the gospel accounts that's not found in Paul's epistles, very um, interesting enough. And uh, it's the title, The Son of Man, um, that's used. Um, and so that's where we get into verse 13 and 14 where Jesus is wanting us to, he's alluding back to this passage. Yes. So, yes. You want so me to Daniel, read it? Yeah, or, yeah, if you want to, sure. Okay. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Um, you know, we notice here some language, actually, uh, back to Daniel 2, 44, in the days of, you know, these kings, God of heaven will set up a kingdom, which, you know, that will never be destroyed. It, it's going to keep on going. Exactly. Um, so, you know, sadly, a lot of people take this verse and they want to say, well, this is going to take place at the second coming of Jesus. And that's just not true. This actually took place during the first coming of Jesus. You know, uh, at the end of his ministry, uh, when he, after he arose from the dead, he ascended back into heaven. And that's where he received his yes. kingdom. Um, exactly. So, yeah, at the first coming, the uh, the kingdom was inaugurated at his first coming. And uh, ultimately, I, I think this passage, though, does, I think it encompasses the entire period between his first coming and his second coming, ultimately, because it's during this period that the kingdom it continues to grow. And mm -hmm. uh, as more people become Christians, the kingdom is growing. And you see here that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. And it's an everlasting dominion. So that continues on even into, you know, his second coming when, mm -hmm. the, you know, the kingdom will be, well, you know, you know, Paul describes it as, you know, an entrance into the everlasting kingdom. And so right. mm -hmm. I, I would think that this verse is encompassing both the inauguration of the kingdom and, and its ultimate consummation um, mm -hmm. at the second coming. Right. Yeah. Um. The fact that it's interesting how many times Son of Man is used by Jesus, and it's actually used 85 times in 81 verses in the Gospel accounts. So, yeah. you know, that, that's, yeah, that's, it's, it's, yeah, that should tell us something. Like, this is a very important. <laughs> um, yeah, and like and like you were saying earlier, pretty much only Jesus uses this description of himself. I think it occurs maybe one or two other times outside. Uh, outside of the Gospels. And so Jesus, this is his favorite way to describe himself. It's his favorite title, believe it or not. It, you know, Jesus doesn't call himself the Son of God as much as he calls himself the Son of Man. And so that should give us a hint. Well, what is, why is he calling himself the Son of Man? 
Well, the Jews knew exactly what Jesus meant when he called himself the Son of Man. Uh, mm -hmm. They knew he was talking about this passage and the messianic implications of it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Jesus said that, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Right. Um, so um, th that's one of the things we need to recognize. So, you know, a lot of people think that Son of Man refers to the humanity of Jesus, but it actually re refers to his divinity. Um, yeah, it's 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 a clear reference to um, the fact that he, yeah, he is both human and divine, and mm -hmm. the Son of Man in Daniel seven is clearly a divine figure. It's not an ordinary human being. He's an extraordinary human being. Uh, he's in, of course, the New Testament gives us a fuller picture of it. And you know, John's Gospel, we learn that the Word became flesh. You know, and, the, and that the Word, not you know, not only was with God, but the Word you know, basically is God. So, um, yeah, Son of Man is a reference to Jesus being God in the flesh. Yeah, it refers, so it refers to his divinity, his authority, um, yes. his power. Uh, there's there's all sorts of passages we could go to, but um, I want to go suffering servant because he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Um yeah, here, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Yes. Uh, remember how he said to the when he was in his trial, then they would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Um, definitely, I believe, in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, yeah, and so that, that's an interesting discussion. It's, so if... I think it's referring back to this passage here in Daniel 7. So when the Son of Man... Uh, it's coming in the clouds in Daniel 7. Is that the ascension of Jesus? Or is it referring to his coming in judgment on Jerusalem? Or is it referring to his coming in judgment at, you know, at the second coming? Or is the answer yes? Maybe it's, in, maybe it's in, <laughs> encapsulating all of all. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and yeah. I do know it's referring to his ascension. That's, that's definitely... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and and later on in this prophecy, reference is made to the ancient of days coming to judge the fourth beast, and so right, you know, it, it's almost and it's you know when you when you look at the New Testament, the coming of the Son of Man is used to describe all three. You know, Jesus came through mm -hmm. the establish the the kingdom in Acts two. Jesus came to judge Jerusalem. Through the right. Romans, you know, right. Matthew 24, 21, mm -hmm. and Mark 13. And of course, you know, then you've got in that, you know, Matthew 25, obviously that's talking about the second coming and the final judgment. So it seems to me that, to me, that it, maybe mm -hmm. it, it refers to all three, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's I, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. My first inclination, though, just looking at it, is it's referring to the ascension. At least here in, in in verses thirteen and fourteen. Well, we're going to find out later on. That, interesting, the kingdom is given to the saints. Um, yeah, and, and I find that very interesting uh, because it, I mean, here we are, you know, talking about how the kingdom was given to the Son of Man, but then it it talks about the interpretation of it is that it's given to the to the saints of the Most High. So, very yeah. interesting stuff. So, uh, like we said, when did Jesus come near? to the presence of his father in heaven. Well, um, Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Um, and then Acts 1, 9 through 11, he is, he ascends into heaven. As it says, um, I like, I think it's interesting in Acts 7, 54 through 56, you know, Stephen, he's being on, put on trial and he has that vision and it says, and he says, "Look, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God." So, yes, uh, yes, that, that that's one of the few places outside of the Gospels where that title is used. Um, I think John uses it in Revelation, mm -hmm. um, which probably he uses it in Revelation because he's probably you know he has the Book of Daniel in his mind. <laughs> but um, yeah. It's very, very rarely used outside of the Gospels, which to me is actually a pretty good argument. The fact that 
Jesus actually did refer to himself as the Son of Man, you know, because because of that kind of um, the fact that it's so tilted in terms of how that title is used in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's another it's Jesus' favorite self self title. Some of my favorite Psalms are um, Psalm 22, which is about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then we're all familiar with Psalm 23, which is the good shepherd. And, you know, Jesus talks about himself as I am the good shepherd in John 10. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Um, So I find that kind of interesting. And Psalm 24 is about the ascension. (laughs) So, you know, he, Uh. he died. He died on the cross. He arose from the dead, and then now he gets to ascend into heaven in what that Psalm 24 is referring to. Um, that's very pretty can't, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It can't be a coincidence, can it, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> uh, so, um, like we said, you know, there's been many attacks made on Christians. There's persecution from the Roman Empire. Um, but... Ultimately, Christianity was not stamped out. It, it uh, actually Christianity is the one that turned the Roman Empire upside down and didn't use physical weapons. It, it used the sword of the spirit to conquer the hearts of men. Exactly. So. Unlike the the religion of Islam, mm-hmm. um, when yeah. you compare, it's an interesting comparison when you study the history of Christianity and the history of of Islam and, and you know the Muslim. Uh, history um there are parallels but their parallels are quite sharp they're sharply different religions Mm -hmm. and to me the the evidence for christianity is of of course because of the one this is i think one of the good evidences for christianity is it was able to basically conquer it was able to conquer the roman empire not by physical force but by conquering their hearts with the sword Mm -hmm. of the spirit well, you know, I just find it amazing that, like, First Corinthians 1 says that God uses the weak things of this world to, to, um, to uh, confound the, the wise and the strong. I mean, God, exactly. uses, God uses the cross, you know, an instrument that was known to put criminals on uh, to display the plan of redemption. I mean, um, I would have never thought of using a cross for that. <laughs> But God did, and He knows what He's. Yeah, he's doing. and in like, with, and when you look at Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, you know Zechariah chapter 12, you know verse what 10 through 12, um, the 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 allusions to the crucifixion are interestingly powerful, um, and not only just to those you know to the prophecies about the crucifixion, but also the surrounding details about it is mm-hmm. interesting to me um how jesus fit those details you know perfectly um you know it just cannot be a coincidence it's 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 one of the best proofs uh for for the christian religion yeah uh daniel 7 15 through 28 um so um we're going to read this. Now we're going to turn to the interpretation of it. So we have, uh, a co- we have several sorry. questions here. So we're going to ask the questions. Here are the kings represented by the ten horns. Here are the three horns uprooted by the little horn. Who is the little horn? And since the little horn warns against, wars against the saints, who are these saints of the Most High? What kingdom are they going to possess? And when are they going to possess it? So let's try to discuss these questions uh, while we talk about this text so it says i daniel was grieved in my spirit within my body and the visions of my head troubled me um why was he grieved and uh you know i think it's interesting he's not a materialist he, he doesn't believe he's just flesh and bone <laughs> right he has a spirit he's grieved in his spirit um and we we admit that there are people who have different views about this passage but um, we believe that there's only one view that can really fit the context. Um, so let's try to discuss which one of these are it. So uh, verse 16 says, I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms, which arise out of the earth. 
Um, so pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, this sometimes confuses people. Why are they called Kings as opposed to kingdoms? Well, if you skip on down to verse 23, it becomes obvious that kingdoms and Kings are being used inter- interchangeably. Mm-hmm. And it's the same way in Daniel chapter two, you know, uh, Daniel calls Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold because he's the king that represents that kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes in these prophecies, the you know, a king can represent a, the entire kingdom. So mm-hmm. that's an important point to consider. Um, but sometimes a king, just that's what it means. It's referring to the king. And so it, ultimately, the context has to determine that. Mm-hmm. Um, so... We know here, let's see, we've got the four kings, which represent four kingdoms that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, but the saints of the most high. The, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now, so now that's, here, it's interesting because it just yeah. talked about how, you know, the son of man is the one who's going to receive the kingdom from the ancient of days. Um, yeah, yeah. But here, G- Jesus, he he is our representative. He's fighting for yes. us, and so well. And I, you know, when you get to the Book of Revelation, we find out that we're going to reign with him forever. Mm-hmm. And so, there's a sense in which, you know, Paul Paul describes it as we're joint heirs with with Christ. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we're on the same page, aren't we, Shane? Uh, <laughs> I knew there was a reason why I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're reading the same book. I don't know. Yeah, this, maybe we're reading the same book. So, yeah, you know, when you allow the Bible to explain itself, a lot of times liberal critics, they read a passage, and because they don't view the Bible as being the Word of God, they don't let the Bible be its best commentary. They're they're always my, myopic. They're always focusing in on just that the passage at hand and they a lot of times they don't see the big picture um but if you do believe that the bible is the word of god then obviously we should allow the bible to explain itself and other passages indicate that uh the saints and jesus um both the messiah and his subjects will rule jointly so Okay, um, that, I think that to me is the best way to explain it. Okay, so um, you know it talks about this fourth beast, how it had ten horns, and three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So, um, should we take this number to be literal or figurative? And if it's literal, then we got to figure out what ten specific kings are being spoken about. But if it's figurative, in which sometimes the number ten is, you know, represents a complete number. Um, so. Yeah, in, in apocalyptic literature, I think it's I think you're you made a, a good point here. When you read apocalyptic literature, sometimes numbers don't always refer to quantity. Sometimes they're used symbolically to describe a certain quality. And so, for instance, in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit is described as the seven spirits of God. Well, does that mean the Holy Spirit is composed of seven literal spirits, or no. does the number seven have a more, you know, a deeper meaning to it? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think most people recognize the number seven as, you know, it's a number of completeness, you know, um, and so it's referring perfection. to, you know, perfection. Yeah, that the Holy Spirit is, you know, he's perfect, he's complete, you know, as that kind of idea. And so, um, so numbers can take on that, that symbolic significance. But at the same time, even in the book of Revelation, there, are, you know, there were seven literal churches at Asia. And so um, it's possible that numbers can be used literally, even in a symbolic book. And so we shouldn't automatically rule that out. Um, or it could be both, you know, both described quantity and quality. And um, in my in my view, I I take it to be ten ten literal uh, Roman kings. Well, um, and the reason why because I mean, how else would you make sense of this three? Um, yeah, of the unless kings? you take the number. Th- yeah, unless you take the number three as a symbol. But 
to me, that's really a stretch, I think, in the context here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that's a great point. I, know, I, I, I don't think I considered that in my book, but now that you brought it up, I think that does reinforce the, uh, the idea that the ten here is referring to ten literal kings. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we get into the question, are these kings or are these kingdoms? So <laughs> some take, take the, the king here to represent, a, you know, ten kingdoms. Um, mm-hmm. I, I believe that they're, they're literal kings. And I think it's alluding to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, you know, when in that prophecy... Um, in the, in, when Daniel's interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he says, in the days of these kings, and most interpret that to be referring to the Roman Caesars, you know, the kings of Rome. Um, well, I mean, so, right, right here it says the fourth beast, right, which is Rome. Yes. And, and the ten horns that were on its head. So yes, to... and also, and also, when you get into the little horn, it appears that the little horn is 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 actually a person because he's described specifically as a person in in pretty specific detail. And so, I don't think if the if the little horn's a person, then to me, the ten horns seem to me to be referring to also uh, ten persons. So, um, in my view, the best the best way to take the uh, ten horns which Daniel says are 10 kings, um, is to take them as the first 10 Roman emperors of Rome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a horn... So then the question... Horn horn represents power, so... Yes. What kind of rulership did you have in Rome? Well, you had the emperors. So, um, So, now there's an argument, of course, over who to begin with the first emperor. Um, But like you said in your book, there were was Suetonius, Diocastius, and Josephus that believe that Julius Caesar was the first. Well, I mean, Roman leader, Roman emperor. Um, why don't you talk about that? Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. All the ancient historians that I, that I've looked at, pretty much um, Suetonius, uh, Josephus. Uh, Diocassius, they all begin the line of emperors with Julius. And I, I think, uh, to me, it makes the most sense because the very title Caesar originates with the name of Julius. And Julius was the first person who uh, took full um, control over the empire in one person. Um, prior to Julius, I believe Rome was ruled, um, there was a senate, I think. It was, a, it was a republic that ruled the empire mm-hmm. of Rome, but Julius was the first person to to take the entire power of the Roman Empire under his control. Of course, he was assassinated pretty quickly, so he never really had very much time to you know exercise too much control. But nevertheless, um, I think he he uh, all the evidence points to Julius Caesar as being the first Roman emperor. Mm-hmm. So then we have Augustus, in which Jesus was born during his reign. Yes, yes. We've got Tiberius, in which Jesus conducted his personal ministry during that time. Then we yep. got Caligula. We got Boy, Claudius. Caligula, yeah, Caligula was a crazy person. That's a whole other. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting to read Suetonius in his book, The Lies of the Twelve Caesars. All of these Caesars are really interesting to read about, and it just shows you the kind of culture Christianity was growing up in. And it just mm-hmm. makes it even more amazing that, you know, Christianity was able to conquer it. Was he the Sorry. one that wanted, was he the one that wanted to set up a, an idol in the temple uh, of Jerusalem he, or? Yeah. In fact, under Caligula, um, Caligula almost, the, the Roman Jewish war almost began under Caligula. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, he was a pretty he was a crazy person if i remember correctly he even the romans thought caligula was insane i mean he was on he was on par with nero yeah he was on par with nero okay then we got claudius and then we have nero nero we know is nutty (laughs) that's another nero was the yeah nero was the first roman emperor who pretty much persecuted the the Christians on a kind of a mass level, uh, especially in especially in Rome, 
you know, he's very mm-hmm. famous for his persecution of the Christians in Rome in, in the 60s AD. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things um, about Nero, uh, so this, this ends the, after him, it ends the, the Flavian dynasty. Wait, is it the Flavian <laughs> dynasty that comes next? Yeah, so well, basically well. you have the you have you have the dynasty of Julius Caesar, and it's mm-hmm. it's often called the the uh, Julio Claudian dynasty right. after Julius and Claudius. Mm-hmm. So all six of these guys here on the screen are kin to each other, but after mm-hmm. the death of Nero, the dynasty of Julius Caesar uh, dies out, and so you basically have a Roman civil war. And so the question now is, well, who's going to take control over the Roman Empire? And mm-hmm. this is this uh, was during uh, AD 68 and 9. So basically during the latter part of AD 68 through the latter part of AD 69. It's, it's often called the, yeah, it's, it's often called the, the year of the four emperors because uh, and basically in one year you had four emperors of Rome because of, <laughs> because of this Roman civil war. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. So these three emperors between Nero and the 10th emperor, the 10th king, who is? Is uh, Vespasian. Vespasian, yeah. So between Nero and Vespasian, you've got these, what I like to call three hiccup kings, because they <laughs> they never really, they never really uh, gained control, full control over the, uh, the Roman Empire. When Galba became emperor, there were still parts of the Roman emperor that refused to take the lead of Galba. And then, <laughs> then Otho took out Galba. And then, so there was, and then Vitellius, he took out Otho. And then Vespasian ultimately is going to take out Vitellius. And so Vespasian was able to take full control over the Roman empire. And so in that sense, Vespasian and his son Titus uh, became... This is known as the Flavian dynasty. So Mm -hmm. Vespasian and his two sons, Titus and and, uh, Domitian. Mm -hmm. So you have the 10th, 11th, and 12th kings of Rome. They form the Flavian dynasty, and they take control, full control over the Roman Empire. Uh, And so these three kings, the uh, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, they get uprooted by Vespasian and his son Titus. Mm -hmm. And And it's worth noting... Yeah, it's worth noting that Josephus uh, says that Vespasian and Titus were both declared Caesar at the same time. So even though Vespasian is technically a full-fledged Roman emperor, it was understood that Titus would be next in line to the throne, and so he was also given the title of Caesar. Mm-hmm. That's worth uh, that's worth noting here. Mm-hmm. And so we believe him to be the Titus is the little horn. Yeah, in my, my view, uh, I think this is the little horn. It's because he, he's described as little because he's not yet a full fledged Roman emperor. He's just the Roman general. He's second in command, but he plays a major role in uh, destroying Jerusalem. And so the Jews would view Titus as being more stout than the other. Uh, the other emperors because he was making war with the saints as you have here on the screen. He was the main person in charge of the Roman Jewish war. Vespasian left him in charge. Uh, While Vespasian assumed the throne, he went back to Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, left his son Titus uh, in charge of the war against Jerusalem. And so he would wear out the saints. And so th- then the question becomes, who are the saints here? Is this referring to the entire, is this referring to the Jews? Is this referring to the church? Who are the mm-hmm. saints? Well, uh, in my view, in the context of Daniel, these would have to be Jews because Daniel's obviously writing to Jews. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Jewish Christians, and mm-hmm. so they would be the ones affected most by Titus, they, their, you know, their entire culture was pretty much wiped out by Titus. Um, when you think about, I mean, the destruction of the temple would be parallel to, as an American, the destruction of the White House. Even though I don't think the White House has religious <laughs> significance anymore, 
I would consider that persecution if my White House was completely destroyed. If Washington, D.C. was completely destroyed, I would interpret that as persecution and as an affront to me. You know, the mm-hmm. destruction of the temple. The dest- and, and also, you know, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, you know, there were a lot of well-off Christians who were living in Jerusalem. Remember in Acts, you know, Barnabas sold a piece of land, you know, to help the, you know, the needy saints, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, they had to leave Jerusalem and give up their property. And, mm-hmm. and it was destroyed, wiped out by, you know, it was burned to the ground, basically, by Titus during mm-hmm. that three and a half year war. And so the Jewish Christians, uh, they would have perceived that as persecution during that three and a half year war. And so that's my view. I think that's who the saints are, the Jewish Christians um, and you and you just explain the times, time and half a time, three and a half years. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I probably got a little ahead of myself. I get excited when I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, the ten. So let's let's read this. So it says, then he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. Shall devour the whole earth, trample it, break it in pieces which is, we already said, the Roman Empire. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, which we just showed who they were. And another shall arise after them. Um, Well, that would have to be Titus, because he arises after Vespasian, which is the tenth horn. Uh, He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Um. Yeah, so he, yeah, he shall rise after them. Yeah, that, that would have to be Titus, and he shall be different from the first ones. That indicates that he's not a full-fledged Roman emperor yet, um, and he will subdue three kings. He's a part of the Indian dynasty that uprooted those three kings. So that's the way I, that's the way I take it. Mm-hmm. So, well, um, how how do we know, just curiosity, I mean, I may, I may just, how do we know this is not Vespasian? I'm just kind of curious because. Well, I mean, um, if you, if you start the list with Julius, then the, mm-hmm. the uh, tenth horn would be Vespasian and the eleventh horn would be Titus. Um, mm-hmm. So that's the reason why. I suppose you could argue that. If the number 10, say, is symbolic and perhaps it's just a round number describing the, the list of emperors. Mm-hmm. So it's a possibility that maybe the little horn is Vespasian. I'm open to that possibility. Uh, but to me, the best the best interpretation is Titus because Titus is the one that directly controlled uh, the persecution against Jerusalem. You know, mm-hmm. Vespasian left his son Titus to, to take control over that. And so, um, mm-hmm. and it seems to indicate you've got 10, you got two, two, uh, you got, well, you've got 10 horns and then you've got the little horns. To me, that even gives more significance as to what the 10 represents. And mm-hmm. so you've got basically what you've got is Vespasian and his son Titus together are the persecuting force against the church in the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, um, and we've already kind of talked about this part here, so um, yeah, maybe yeah. we didn't. Get, maybe the only thing we didn't get talk. What it shall intend to change times and law? What that same phrase is used, I think, back in Daniel chapter two, describing God being able to change times and law. Mm-hmm. And so, what this phrase is talking about is basically the little horn. He, he's He's saying pompous words. He's equating himself with God, more or less. And, of course, you know, all the Roman Caesars thought that they should be worshipped as God, basically. You know, the mm-hmm. um, they, you know, when at their death, they would be deified, et cetera. You know, they would be, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And so, um, to me, that fits that idea. But what's interesting to me, and I don't think I included this in my book, but I, when I was doing some more research about what Josephus had to say about Vespasian and, and, and Titus— Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what uh, even the even Tacitus, I think both Tacitus and Vespasian, they say that Vespasian, excuse me, Tacitus and Josephus say that Vespasian and Titus claimed to be the Messiah that was prophesied in Daniel. Um, there's a there's a reference in Titus in um, I believe it's 
it's both both Suetonius and Tacitus. And Josephus, <laughs> Josephus, when he was captured by Vespasian and Titus, he shows Vespasian and Titus the prophecy in Daniel. And Vespasian actually predicts that Vespasian will be the next ruler over Israel. And I don't know why uh, why Josephus believes this. Perhaps he was trying to save his skin. I don't know, you know. <laughs> but um, when Vespasian and, uh, and Titus realize that they, <laughs> they see the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and they realize, oh, I, I can actually take over the empire, you know, from Vitellius. And uh, so that's why they actually elevate Josephus to this, you know, special, he actually becomes a friend of Titus, uh, mm-hmm. Josephus does, and that's why Josephus writes, you know, his books documenting the war, you know, against Jerusalem. And mm-hmm. in, that, in that book, jo- Josephus talks about this, and so Vespasian and Titus, they claim for themselves to be the fulfillment of this prophecy, and I think they, th- they think they're the son of man, but in reality, they're the little whore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and so they actually believe themselves to be kind of like a messianic figure, um, and uh, and so that, I think that's what Daniel's predicting here. Daniel says that uh, he that the little horn thinks that he's God, that he's he's changing the times and the law, but in reality, um, God is in control, as we shall see, and God will judge the little horn and ultimately judge the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe another thing we might want to say about the three and a half years since it's a half of seven yeah. it means incomplete period of time I mean seven means complete or perfection yeah so. and I think yeah we ought to talk about the time times and half time some people might be uh, not, not understanding where we're getting the three and a half years from well times is a plural of time so that would be two and then you've got t- uh, you got time times so times is two time would be one and half of time is a half so two plus one plus a half is three and a half so we have three and a half units of time and in the book of Revelation John interprets this phrase time times and half the time as being three and a half years and so John. So the book of Revelation kind of sheds a little light on what this phrase time times and half time means. And 1260 um, days. Yeah. Um, yeah. 1200 and f- yeah. Something Six, like 60 yeah, days. 40, yeah. 42 months and yeah. 1760 days or something like that. I, I think is what it is. But uh, um, yeah. So that's three and a half years. Which, like you said, is a is is a half of the number seven, which is symbolic of an incomplete period of time. Um, so, three and a half years, remarkably, that's how long the Roman Jewish War lasted until the destruction of Jerusalem, from mm-hmm. the latter part of sixty six A D to the latter part of seventy A D, which mm-hmm. encompasses about three and a half years. Mm-hmm. All right, so the Bible says, But the court shall be sealed, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting con- con- kingdom, and all dominion dominion shall serve and obey him. So there, yes. once again. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, basically, talking about the judgment upon the Roman Empire and that Christianity actually became the state religion. After Constantine, yes. yes. Um, even though we don't agree with everything Constantine did, <laughs> um. no, but but that I think that shows you how the it shows you the influence and power of the gospel over the Roman Empire mm-hmm. that a Roman emperor would actually make it a state religion uh, is pretty significant. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it's also worth noting that this judgment against the Roman Empire is not really a one-time event. It seems to be described as kind of a process. If you go back up to the original verses there, prior to this slide, um, you know, the court shall be seated. That's talking about the judgment against the fourth beast. They shall take away his dominion. And notice it describes it as consuming and destroying it forever. Uh, 
And then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms and the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints and the messiahs of the church. Uh, it, you know, it's going to be consumed and destroyed forever. So that almost sounds like not a one-time event, but kind of a, a process there, you know. And that's kind of what happened in history. The church grew rapidly and turned the kingdom upside down until eventually, like you said, you know, Constantine declared Christianity as the state religion. And then ultimately, the entire world will be under the everlasting dominion at the second coming. You know, Paul mm -hmm. says that every knee shall bow, you know, at the second coming. So I think this is it's describing it as more of a process than just a event. Mm -hmm. So then Daniel says, it's the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. And my account has changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. And so yeah. uh, one thing I would just point out from chapter 7 is Jesus received the kingdom from his father, um, yes. which he reigns today. He's the last Adam who would reverse everything that, that evil has happened. Yes. Um, and he received it. He received the kingdom when he went up into heaven at the right hand of God. Um, and then Christians also are able to re be re received into the kingdom of God when we obey the gospel. Um, we become Christians. Um, and yes, even though we may be persecuted and even though, uh, I mean, that's happening in some parts of the world. Um, if we're faithful, even in, even up to the point of death, if we have to give our own lives, then, um, you know, we we have we're going to reign with Christ forever. Um so that's why the fourth kingdom was being taken possession, it, you know, because the kingdom of God did conquer the Roman Empire. So, yes, yes, and ultimately the kingdom of God uh, will conquer the world. That's that, of course, that will ultimately occur at the second coming. Um, but even now, even after the fall of the Roman Empire, we look at the influence of Christianity on the entire globe. One billion plus people. To, you know, uh, you know, they declare their allegiance to Christ. Now, I'm not saying that they ob have mm -hmm. obeyed the gospel perfectly, but they nevertheless worship Christ. They nevertheless declare their allegiance to Christ. Mm -hmm. And that just shows you the, the ever growing influence and power of the kingdom the of God in the world, even after the fall of the Roman Empire. And of course, ultimately, you know, on the last day, um, uh, as Paul says, every knee shall bow, you know, and de in and declare Christ as you know as being Lord. So, um, and so, like I said, this is this is a process that's is a prophecy that's that's still in the process of being fulfilled. And we have seen the early stages of it were fulfilled in in the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Roman Empire and. Uh, it's interesting to me to note that the fall of Jerusalem, physical Jerusalem, was given over to the Roman Empire. When Jesus died on the cross, who did the Jews declare to be their king? Christ? Caesar. <laughs> Caesar. They said, we have no king but Caesar. So at that point, physical Jerusalem was no longer spiritual. It was no longer God's people. They were no longer God's people. The church had taken the place of physical Jerusalem. And Daniel's going to develop this thought in his later prophecies about the contrast between physical Jerusalem and spiritual Jerusalem when we get into the 70-week prophecy, when we get into chapters 11 and 12. Ultimately, the, the uh, spiritual Jerusalem will supplant physical Jerusalem. And that's what this prophecy is talking about here. Physical Jerusalem was actually a part of the fourth beast. They declared Caesar to be their king. Physical Jerusalem was destroyed by, ironically, you know, we talk about, you know, um, uh, the fourth empire was made up of iron and clay, you know, in chapter mm -hmm. two. I think that's, that's what that's talking about. Physical Jerusalem, in, in the Old Testament, the Jews were often to, uh, described as clay. And so physical Jerusalem was a part of the fourth beast because they refused to honor Jesus as their king and honor God as their king. And so physical Jerusalem was a part of the fourth beast. And so when Titus destroyed Jerusalem, 
basically you got Rome, the Roman Empire destroying itself, and it began with the destruction of Jerusalem. And then ultimately that process began with the destruction of Jerusalem, and ultimately the entire Roman Empire, of course, fell to Christianity. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's so, well, that's one of the things that changed my mind about the Book of Revelation. I once believed in the late date, um, right? But when, right. but when I when I got to Revelation eighteen, talking about the harlot, and it says uh-huh. the, be- the beast destroys the harlot. Uh, well, I was like, well, um, I don't know if that's hey, Rome, ta- you know, de- destroying Rome itself. Um, it makes more sense. So that's Rome, the beast destroying Jerusalem, the unfaithful city. Um, yeah. And like you were just saying, yeah. uh, here, here, the, you know, the, the 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 crime syndicate, so to speak, of Revelation is the dragon, and uh-huh. then you got the beast, you got the false prophet, and you got the harlot. Well, the beast destroys the 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 the, the harlot, so it, just, it destroys one of the allies of Satan. I just find that kind exactly. of exactly, you know, yeah. So. There's there's a there's a distinction between Jerusalem and Rome. But at the same time, the very fact that John describes Jerusalem as being Babylon, and the Jews themselves thought of Rome as Babylon. And you look at the Jewish literature outside of, you know, outside of the Bible, you know, that's one of the arguments that people make that Babylon in Revelation is the Roman Empire. Well, yeah, I can understand why the Jews thought of Rome as Babylon. But mm-hmm. what don't realize is by declaring Caesar to be their king, they were aligning themselves with the Roman Empire, and so in that sense, they were aligning themselves with Babylon, you know. And um, oh, and another thing is what's interesting to me, and this is I might be chasing rabbits here, but in Matthew 24, when Jesus talks about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, he borrows imagery from Isaiah 13 in the fall of Babylon. And so Jesus uses imagery describing the fall of Babylon and applies it to the fall of Jerusalem, which I think is kind of cool because that's basically what John does in Revelation. He, he applies the imagery of Babylon to, to the harlot. And, I, of course, I think you agree with me, the harlot there is Jerusalem. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, well, I mean, I, that's kind of chasing rabbits. I think we're, <laughs> we've probably gone beyond Daniel 7, but that's, that's the... Uh, I think that's where this prophecy kind of leads into ultimately. When you when you read when you read the book of Daniel, you read these prophecies, uh, they they tie in with what Jesus says in Matthew twenty four in the Olivet Discourse, and they tie in with what John, you know, is describing in, in his book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we had a good discussion today. Um, so, everybody. Yes. Buy, buy David's book. We put the email at the very first of the video, so you can just go back to the first of the video and get that email. Um, and yes. Thank uh, you next for time, watching, everybody. <laughs> next time we're gonna next time we're gonna look at chapter eight and talk about Antiochus. Uh, well, Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. Yes. So yes, the prophet Daniel is absolutely amazing when you start looking at these prophecies and how. They fit with secular history. Um, the liberal critics, I can see why you know they want to do their best to destroy the book of Daniel because it completely undermines mm-hmm. atheism and naturalism and unbelief. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to the discussion on chapter 8 and the prophecy there. All right. Well, signing off, everybody. Have a good Bye day. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>